I'm going to do a little bit of an overview. Um, we're kind of a Galaxy wine company as a homegrown distributor. We started from scratch and uh, kind of decided to reinvent the wheel. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, my experiences with distribution, and I'm going to leave it to my other colleagues to uh, get into a little more, bit more of the nuts and bolts. So um, I've uh, fell hopelessly in love with wine about 37 years ago. I started working for a California liquor store deli that had a great wine selection. And uh, once I started learning about wines, I just, um, I just never went back to the studies that I went to school for. Um, I moved to Oregon in the summer of 1985 and uh, was a retailer. And uh, as a retailer in 1985, I was very excited to help promote uh, all of Oregon's 30 some odd wineries. And I was also very excited about the 1983 vintage Pinot Noirs that were coming out. So I have a nice long history uh, with, with the trade here. Um, I owned a wine shop called Liner and Elson Wine Merchants, and it still exists today. Uh, had a successful run from 1990 to 1999, and with my partner, Matt Elson, in the wine shop, we chose to go into distribution. It was just kind of a change of idea. There was a need in the market. Um, a lot of wineries were saying, we know you can do it. So we figured we had the understanding uh, that retailers needed. We knew what retailers needed and wanted. And uh, we could learn the business. And uh, as, as we grew, and uh, we ate at a lot of restaurants, so that's, there's a qualification for uh, helping out the restaurants as well. So we started from scratch, and we joined uh, the dark side, is what we used to call distribution. Hence, uh, we used to use the term, in, you know, Star Wars was big when we started, so in a galaxy far, far away, hence Galaxy Wine Company, joining the dark side, distribution. So distribution is, uh, a lot of people say, is that necessary evil, um, the vulture in a three-tier system, right? Where it's an archaic system so that's been here since the repeal of prohibition. It's producer, wholesaler, retailer. And a lot of people think we just stand there with our hand out asking 25 to 30% to deliver your wines. But um, what I want to talk about a little bit is what, what we offer, what a distributor offers, uh, the value added of a distributor. So a distributor is a company who has a license to sell certain wine brands and in a certain territory or state. The distributor does not own a winery and does not own wines. They simply purchase wine from a winery at a discount and then sell it for a profit. So it's very, very simple. There are small distributors that may represent 20 to 30 um, little wineries. And then there's medium distributors that represent 100 or a couple hundred wineries. And then there are the larger distributors um, that, that move a lot of wine everywhere. Um, the reason a distributor is good is that um, we offer, um, offer a lot of wines, and it, uh, it, we try to suit the needs of customers with the variety, with the selection that we do. So the chances of sales are, are better with a distributor. A wine distributor does more than just deliver wine, and, uh, and uh, it's, you know, it's all about value added. So ideally, a sales force is made up of women and men who are passionate about wine and love what they do. So you have a lot of feet on the street. Uh, many people believe that the wine distributors are brand ambassadors. Uh, we are wine marketers. We are wine educators. And um, we'll perform those aspects in the roles of, uh, in the course of doing our business. We pour samples. We make wine lists. 
we make retail shelf placements. We do the wine by the glass. We provide the staff uh, education that's necessary to sell the wines. So there's definitely value added. As an individual winery going out, you can go direct. That's one of the beauty, beauties of uh, the Oregon system is as a winery, you can bypass one of the tiers. But uh, we do, distributors do offer a pathway that eventually as a winery, you won't be able to uh, take care of on your own. So wine distributors uh, also make relevant uh, suggestions to the uh, wineries and their suppliers. Con we make suggestions concerning the packaging and how well it works in the market. We suggest pricing that works uh, better in the market, hopefully not lower than you expect. Um, we ensure that the wines are actually uh, represent what's on the label. Uh, we add more, we can add more credibility to the wines, and we also ensure that the taxes and fees are paid to the state. So there is a lot of uh, value added to a distributor's existence. We also help out retailers. Um, we provide them with services. And we also provide them with selection. So with your, when you're with a distributor, you're, um, you're offering a lot more. What you're offering is um, different ways that they can build their own identities and the credibility to their customers and hence build their uh, business. So selection of uh, availability is the key. Um, what distributors do is uh, they select fine wine distributors to showcase various wines. Um, they do that to build themselves up and to promote wineries. Um, and when you are represented with a distributor, you're represented with a number of wines throughout the world. So there's, that adds a lot of credibility to your brands. We also, as a medium-sized distributor, we target independent grocers, um, usually ones that have wine stewards. There's a lot of those around, and it takes a, a serious uh, sales force to reach all of them. They can move a little more volume of wine, and they can tell the story of your wineries. As far as larger chains go, I know that um, the, my uh, colleagues are going to be better versed in that and are going to talk a little bit about um, more of the uh, chain distribution. It's not a place where all of you can play. Wineries usually have to have a certain amount of, of uh, quantity available, and um, they'll be talking about that pathway. And the key uh, for distributors is the restaurants, and the restaurants uh, require a lot of time, and it's important to get your wines in restaurants. Um, this is the place where, where wineries build their reputations from, from being available on lists. Um, restaurants require a lot more love and a lot more expertise than retailers. They require a lot more service and a lot more thoughtfulness, um, and they just require a lot. Um, and we usually have specialized reps that take care of that. Um, the other thing that, um, especially in the Portland area, um, wineries to stand out uh, require a certain amount of coolness. I'll talk about what's cool. But first of all, to do your jobs, I mean, for us to do our jobs as a distributor, as distributors, we need to ask a few questions. So you need to know uh, what, what's expected. Um, we need to know as distributors uh, what the winery's expectations are. And I'm sure all of you have them. We need to have clear and concise information about how much wine you make how much wine you want to sell, how long the wine will be around, when the wine is being released. We're always asking you questions, but this helps us plan, put a plan together for your particular wineries. 
We also need to know the pricing structure of your wines. Even though you think your wines are priced competitively in the market, we need to look at it and we need to see if they really are. We need to know who your competi competition is and how you compare. And we need to make sure that your wines, once on the shelf or on a restaurant list, have a certain amount of pull through. And that's the key. We also uh, need to know what you think about your wines and why we should sell your wines, uh, besides the fact that they're your wines and they're really, really good. So uh, most of the sales reps are pretty passionate about wine and they want to know what makes you as a winery, what makes you real? Um, why do your wines matter in the marketplace? What makes them worth selling? What makes them unique? Um, things like are they live or bio or organic or is there a story about the property or the soils or the owner's profile or are you planting cool varietals like Syrah and Tempranillo and everything in addition to Pinot Noir. Um, we need to know all of those. But really the final thing that we need to know that I had mentioned before so you need to know, we need to know if your wines are cool. That seems to be what's happening, especially in, the, in Oregon, but especially in the Portland market. Um, there's a lot of frustration when you get there. As, as kind of an old guy uh, in the industry, and, and Galaxy is uh, 15 years old, and so we think we're newcomers, but we're kind of getting old guys in the industry. Um, the Portland buyer, both the retailer and the restaurateur, are um, very difficult. The huge trend in the wine business is about being cool. I think that Portland, for example, probably has more hipster restaurants than, than anywhere else, and it's very, very difficult to break into them. And it's not something you can just go to one time and they go, yeah, that, that's it. So. Um, we need to know, you know, we need to know how you're perceived in the marketplace. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, something that's hard to figure out and kind of the cool factor. What, what is cool? And it seems that um, there's a big value placed in the wines in Portland area. It's not what you know. It's definitely not the quality of your wine. It's who you know. It's uh, make sure that you, they want you to be part of the, of the in crowd. You know, you have to have the most likes on Facebook and Instagram. You have to have the coolest pictures of rare wine and, and food on Facebook and Instagram. And that seems to be the litmus test for what Oregon buyers think is cool. If you, um, it's, um, if your production is two or 3,000 cases, don't worry, you're automatically in the cool state for a lot of the Oregon, Oregon buyers, the cool level. Um, being new, very cool. It creates a buzz, um, kind of gets your mojo going. Um, customers always love something new. So being cool is kind of where it's at. There's a lot of competition for coolness in the Northwest. And uh, um, people just love the wineries that, uh, that project their, their cool. And uh, hopefully they become a flash, a flash in the pan at some point or they grow out of it. Now, if you make more than say 5,000 cases, you're kind of heading out of that cool factor for a lot of our, um, our buyers, but um, uh, your cool might diminish a little bit, but don't worry because um, as long as you're knowledgeable and you're um, good about telling your story and you get your distributor to tell your story, um, you're smart and responsive and we get the information from you. Uh, the lack of cool is uh, made up by being loved and respected in the marketplace. Um, So, 
kind of a, a f goofy little thing to end with, but as a smaller distributor, definitely not a small distributor, there are ways that everybody's gonna talk about, about uh, distribution. There are ways to get your wines to the market. Um, but as a smaller distributor, I have to take all of these things in to uh, consideration. We need to make sure that our, the young buyers uh, are met with people that are from our company that are also the young buyers and they speak at the same level. It's very hard, you know, everybody hears about all the restaurants in Portland and, um, and they're very difficult to get into. And as Oregon wineries, they actually uh, limit a lot of the small hipster restaurants, I won't name very many of them, but they only carry a handful of Oregon wines and it's about how you stand out in the marketplace. So it's always good every year to think about this and to reinvent yourself. So as far as generally the intro to uh, distribution, uh, that's pretty much all I have. I'm gonna leave it open, get it open for uh, uh, questions and um, there you go, anybody have Yes, Tom. Thank you, Bob, for those comments. I'm, I'm questioning maybe your, your experience. You mentioned cool a couple of times. Sorry. Yeah. Cool a couple of times over your very history and, and your rich experience. Who has done that well, positioned themselves as cool, but yet maybe not wound up being a flash in the pan? Well, I think, do um, you want me to name names of wineries or okay i mean well yeah one of um one of the wineries that i think has uh they're they're not huge but the, the guy is very engaged with his customers and the guy is everywhere and he's a little bit on the outrageous side um, as uh, John Paul from Cameron Winery. And though uh, for some other wineries that are his size, they've kind of, um, I don't want to say that they've played themselves out in the market, but they definitely have become more relaxed and older and more mature. And uh, John, for example's outrageous style kind of keeps him in there slugging with all the new upstarts, the bow and arrows, or the, um, you know, uh, all these small couple thousand case capacity wineries. So um, he's a guy, I guess, you know, at the beginning we were talking about being fluid and, and kind of reinventing yourself as time goes on. And that's one thing at Galaxy that we're very conscious about. As a distributor, how are we relevant in the marketplace? How can we always relate to the new upstarts? Who's coming? And how do we take our wineries that are established and compete in that uh, arena? And sometimes, you know, the competition is all about um, the volume. I mean, you know, sometimes you're at a different level uh, getting things in. But by having winemakers constantly coming out in the marketplace and keeping relevant and meeting and greeting the uh, accounts, that's what kind of keeps you young at heart, at least in, in the market. And very, very important. Yes. Um, you know, when you go in the grocery store today, uh, it's amazing how much space is now devoted to craft beers yes. uh, compared to even a year ago. Well, I mean, I, th I think that's, yeah, Sorry. yes. Um, well, it, I guess the, the question is that uh, there's, there's a lot of craft beers are, are taking up a good part of, uh, of the market, uh, market share. And um, how do wineries uh, compete with that? Do, do they keep coming up with craft wineries? The problem is, oh, yes. Oh. Um, you ask your question, that way we can make sure that the question is recorded and you don't have to repeat it. Oh, got it. Okay. Oh, okay.
things. Um, you know, the, uh, that's kind of a little uh, difficult question because the smaller wineries, as if, talking in relation to the grocery stores, are uh, some of these small wineries are not the guys that are going to be able to make it into the grocery store to compete with the craft beers because there is a, a system, an authorization system that uh, kind of keeps just anybody from going in. They're, the competition uh, is, uh, uh, there's just a lot, of, uh, a lot of paperwork that's involved with it. But you can, we can, the small guys can compete uh, in the independent stores, in some of the independent chains, but definitely in the independent small stores. And where they come in is um, in, the, in the restaurants. That's actually where the small craft wineries play. So, you know, to protect themselves from craft beer in the, uh, in the grocery store, that's, that's a difficult thing because there's an authorization system that probably doesn't allow those craft wineries to play in there. So, yes? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Thanks. Hi. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, awesome. Um, so my question is actually the opposite of the first gentleman's question, mm -hmm. which is, are there wineries um, and meaderies even that have actually made it without, like when you were speaking about the cool factor, yeah. you know, of course there was a big tongue in cheek deal connected yes, to that. Absolutely. We all probably hope that a great quality product with a lot of heart yeah. is going to make it irrespective of how many likes it gets on Facebook. Yes, <laughs> so, yes. so my question is, would you be willing to name the name of a few folks who have made it really kind of irrespective of a huge marketing blitz? I mean, are there any none? <laughs> Are there any places like that? Uh, yeah, um, I, and I'm not understanding. Are there wineries that have Basically, have made it through yeah. their their young years and? Yeah, and have kind of stood on their own without doing a huge marketing blitz and social media. Yeah. I guess, I guess what I'm, I'm saying, I, and I kind of almost don't, social media is kind of marketing that happens. So um, I think it's part of uh, a lot of these people's lifestyle that start some of these small uh, wineries. Um, I mean, this cool thing, and you're right, I, I say it tongue in cheek, and if you could all see me, my eyes actually roll all the way back in my head when I say cool and come back out again. It's a very, um, it's a phenomenon that's very difficult uh, to deal with. Um, and it's, uh, but it's something very serious in the Portland area where, where these restaurants are looking for those things. But um, I think this coolness thing is only been in the last few years, I've seen a lot of the wineries, I've never seen anybody kind of fade out of, out of coolness. They seem to, to have a few year uh, run with it going so far. Ultimately, the wineries that have been with us the longest, whether they're 2,000 or 3,000 or 10,000 or 30,000 or all right, um, these are wineries who have made their ways and then, and um, the, um, the buyers, which is the difficult, most difficult thing to do, the buyers need to understand the commercial value of their lists. And that's kind of what we talk about all the time. You know, what's cool, it's kind of fun to have one or two of those on the list, but when people come from out of town to eat at their restaurants, or people go into wine shops to buy wine, and they see this plethora of labels, that are all wineries that are one and two years old and they've never heard of before. It's always good to have the tried and true, the people have come up through the ranks and made, made uh, the sales and have grown and who actually represent, you know, the, really what Oregon does. Those people are always gonna be there and those people are the most important people, but our job as a wine distributor, we just run into this cool thing so much just to be in those right restaurants. We spend a lot of our time 
uh, kind of uh, taking the, the less cool and uh, explaining to our customers why those wines need to be on their list because that's actually where the money is made. It seems like when you're dealing with that factor, a lot of the buyers in those small restaurants are out to mostly make a name for themselves and um, not always, the buyers are not always the owners. They're not always looking out for the interest of the business. Um, and those are the things that, uh, as you know, Galaxy kind of gets in there and deals with every day. And we have specialists in the restaurant business who can relate to people and can, can talk about that too. So I'm not saying it's doom and gloom for anybody that's over 3,000 cases or anybody that's uh, maybe not perceived as cool. I hope I don't have to say that anymore today. Uh, but um, um, that is kind of a, one of the roadblocks in selling wine and one of the hardest things for a small or medium-sized distributor to, to overcome. We need our young force, our, kind of, our force that really knows the competitors and, and knows what's going on and loves those little cool wines but also can sell wines for everybody else. Yes? I don't know. Oh. oh, yes. Um, just curious, how proactive is Galaxy in seeking out new labels for their catalog? How many new wineries have you added in the last 12 months? Okay, that's a good the process for a winery if they want to be with Galaxy. Okay. Um, we have, um, you know, um, we have gotten to a point in, in our lives, uh, meaning Galaxy, where we have a tremendous selection of wines. We have a lot of wines. Um, and we're constantly, we're, we actually use the term that we're pretty darn full. And the, the way that, um, what this means is that we look at our sales force and we look at the goals that we have with our other wineries. And when we think about bringing in another winery, um, we always have to think about it, how it affects our salespeople and how it affects the sales of all of our other wineries. And there are a lot of people that knock on our door on a, I'd say on a weekly basis. Um, um, Oregon, Washington, wines everywhere else in the world. And really, um, it's very difficult. We, we really have to, have to think it through. Um, we all are always conscious of where we are and how our customers perceive us as well. We talk to our salespeople all the time about what's going on in the streets. And um, as we like to say it, who's eating our lunch? Um, uh, restaurants are the most important thing for us, and uh, that's where we want to spend a lot of time. So we think about not only in-house, who we're bringing on, but we think about how it affects our business and how it affects the business uh, for everybody else in our book. That being said, as I say that we say no more, no more, we brought, we brought in, in the last 18 months, there's, there's been a lot of wine that has come into our house. Uh, less of it has been, most of it has been in the import world um, with uh, import portfolios. Um, but our, uh, we encourage Oregon wineries. We really, uh, that's the future for us. It makes great business sense for us to handle more Oregon wineries because we they're here we purchase them regularly they sell through on a weekly or bi-weekly basis there's a tremendous amount of cash flow and that means a lot to a distributor our, our size so um, when we take on a new winery we do we kind of look at what people are saying about it um, and we look about look at how what kind of volume it does whether it makes a difference for us. And, um, you know, we've probably added uh, four or five Oregon and Washington wineries to our portfolio in the last 18 months. 
but we've probably added about 50 imports. Um, things change. I'd like to say something needs to leave before something comes in, but the reality is we just uh, wait until we feel we can do a good job and absorb it, and we can do the good thing for the winery. So, yes. distributors are saturated, as you kind of pointed out, yeah. and seeing that, how do you, for our, I mean, on our side, besides rebranding, relabeling, and coming up with something super old, uber cool, mm -hmm. how do you deal with that on a realistic level from a winery's perspective of, you can only put so much in a restaurant, so do you have any other things besides the cool, cool factor? Yeah, I think, um, so, um, did, did everybody kind of hear that as far as, you know, what's, what's um, besides the cool, cool factor, how, how do uh, other winery, you know, how do wineries get their wines in restaurants? And is that sort of... Right. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's a difficult thing, but I think that uh, you know, at a certain level, the wineries need to be very involved alongside their distributors. I think that's important. It it not only helps you out and you understand the market uh, better, but it is very helpful to the um, to the distributor. Um, you know, my salespeople love to complain about ride widths. Um, it requires a lot of energy, a lot of time. It takes away from maybe taking orders in a grocery store or whatever. But it's really, the, it's really an important thing for them because a winery gets to tell the story because they see the, they see the salesman every week. And then sometimes it's kind of blah, 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 you know, you're here every week. Um, and to have a winery come and tell the story, it's very refreshing and it really kind of um, um, allows, um, well, allows for those opportunities. So what you're doing is working alongside your small distributor is the best you can, is, is the best thing to do. Um, and you need to help them out with as many restaurants as you can do, as, as you can uh, handle. You know, um, some of the, like New Seasons is, is, is a, um, a place to work on that offers smaller wineries an incredible venue of, of wines, uh, a lot of volume of wines to sell. So you need to pick and choose your markets, but you do need to work alongside your alongside your distributor, it's the long path, but it works. When, oh. Hi, Bob. Hi. Olga with Wine Company. Hi. We're a pretty small winery. You're one of the cool ones, yeah, though. So I just want you to know. Uh, we're cool, but we're very poor. So yes, that makes cool. it a little better. Um, my question is, so we're in several markets that we've actually never visited, like, for example, Boston. Mm -hmm. And every time we want to come out and do ride-alongs, they're like, oh, it really stresses out the salespeople. You know, we can sell your wine without you guys coming out. But come out for our portfolio tasting, right. which is one day. Yes. So it's a lot of money to spend flying all the way to Boston, yeah. staying overnight there. So we haven't done it, um, but is it worth the money to go for a one-day tasting event when everyone's cramming in there? From What's from our way? perspective, it's 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 a similar story. We sometimes we get a little busy for some of our wineries. Uh, sometimes we have to decide if. If the, you know we're we're crowded and we don't have the ability to have somebody work, maybe there's other people in the market. We have a small smaller force of 12 people, uh, f 
12 people in the Portland market. And if I get four wineries that come in, I don't, you know, our guys just don't have the ability to take people around. But we always do pe tell people to come to our trade tasting. Um, that is once a year and people do fly in for it. And I will tell you, it's, um, it's a place that if you have a good trade tasting, um, if a distributor has a good trade tasting, you get a tremendous amount of buyers that are coming and looking for something new. You have the opportunity to spend a little time with them. Maybe you can stay in the market for an extra day or so. But um, I think that is an incredible opportunity to show your wine to more people than you could possibly show it to in a dozen ride widths. So, um, I would always consider, I mean, we, we always want people to come to our trade show. It's a huge uh, undertaking. It costs a lot of money for everybody, um, but I think the benefits are, uh, are great. So. Bob, uh, yes. fine wine now, and there's a lot more entrance. My question for you is, can you identify some of the, uh, the, the galaxies of the future and so forth? Are you the companies, or just and maybe make a few comments about what the, uh, what the environment is like in terms of some of the folks here who are looking for distribution, yet, as you say, your book is full, but there are options out there. And the second part is, um, it is really critical for the Oregon Wine Board and for our entire industry to capture more market share in this state. So we hear you talk about bringing in lots of imports, and we know it's something sommeliers are looking for, but we also need to evolve strategies to take back some of that share from California and Washington and, and uh, imports. Thanks. Absolutely, yes. Um, so uh, as far as uh, distribution stands, in, um, in Oregon, it's kind of hard to believe, but there are about 50 wine distributors in Oregon, uh, most of them playing in the Portland area. So it's a very, very crowded field. Now realize that you know the distributors are Young's and, and Southern at the top, and Galaxy fits in below that, and there are a handful, which I'll mention, of kind of medium uh, or smaller to medium sized distributors. And then there's a whole slew of small distributors who I said maybe represent um, 20 or 30 wines. And um, maybe some of you are with some of those. Um, but it makes for a very crowded field. And the, the um, frustration is that as a retail buyer, especially, or a, re a restaurant buyer, one thing about uh, Oregon buyers is everybody wants to be fair and everybody wants to give everybody a chance. And so they spend a lot of time talking to everybody and they get a little stressed and uh, it's, it becomes a little difficult. Um, but there are probably, there are a handful of distributors that would kind of, I'd call maybe medium size that, that would suit a, a lot of people's needs. Um, there's kind of old school as Lemma Wine Company is, is still around and they have a very seasoned uh, force. They've been around since the mid 70s and they're, they're a very solid wine company. Um, there, is, um, uh, there are companies like uh, Casa Bruno that are always looking for small wine distributors. Mitchell Wine Company. Um, so if you write these down, you can kind of look online and kind of get an idea of, of, of who they are. I'm going to feel bad if I miss some of, you know, miss some of them, but they're probably not here, so they won't get mad at me. Uh, Estelle is another smaller one, but uh, one that works well in the market. Um, anyway, there's, I think that's, that's probably a good 
first run of, of small distributors. Then you get down to some that are truly small and they are maybe effective in a very small area, but a lot of them maybe don't cover outside of Portland area. So you wanna find a distributor that at least covers the state or at least what I call the uh, I-5 corridor. So, you know, that's about 80, 80 plus percent of the wine sales in the state is right along I-5 from Portland down to, uh, to Ashland. The, uh, oh, and then as far as, uh, excuse me, I was trying to remember part two is how, um, how do we take people like us, <laughs> no, um, promoting Oregon and promoting Washington uh, over and above imports. And um, I know that, you know, Oregon has always been a market that has embraced imports, uh, you know, from when the industry was, was very, very small. It was all about Bordeaux and Burgundy. And as things have grown, um, Oregon buyers tend to uh, really like um, esoterica, actually. So we're talking about that cool factor. It's, it's also in imports as well. They're looking for the next place that nobody's heard of to put on their list to kind of build a name for themselves. So there's always going to be that, I think, as the Oregon buyer always wants to be unique. And I think the Oregon buyer always wants to, you know, everybody wants to be different than everybody else. So there's always gonna be that little bit of, of uh, import thing that you're never gonna shake. But I think that the Oregon and the Washington wine business is very, very strong. People, buyers, consumers are very, very loyal. It's always there to stay. I think that our buyers always want to look at Oregon first. There are still a lot of uh, uh, wine uh, venues, restaurants, and retail that are all about the Northwest first. So I think there's, those are the type of things that are actually in place and are still growing. So. Um, I don't think the imports are going to take over everything they do. I think it's still a very strong and vibrant uh, market for Oregon. Yes. Uh, we made about a thousand cases, yeah. and in the last year, I feel like we've outgrown our broker, and we need to take a step up, but we haven't been very successful with that. We've done the cool things. Uh, <laughs> if you know me, you know what I'm talking about. I'm the naked guy behind the barrel yeah. with the train cars, yeah. and I'm the guy that powers the December pressure with a three-wheel recumbent bicycle. We actually do that for practical reasons. But I think in a thousand cases, we're kind of no, no math like and that, that's not enough volume for money for the distributors that we look at. And to, we're too big for the one that we're, we're with because they simply don't have enough people out on the street. Yeah, I think you need, to, you need to find that right distributor for that right size before you decide that maybe if I made more wine, you know, somebody else would take me. Um, there are a lot of small guys. I'm, I mean, are the thousand cases, are those all being sold in state? We've had distribution on the state, but we didn't do any follow-up because it's too expensive for us. People basically asked us <laughs> why we did. They sold it, but everyone's back there and worked with them. We can't afford it, don't have that kind of price. Yeah. So it's mostly in state, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, maybe that's, so that's a lot for uh, a very tiny distributor to sell a thousand cases. You probably want to expand your horizons at least into Washington and, you know, some place that you can travel to to try to build a market. And then you need to kind of step it up on whoever your distributor is to find somebody, maybe in one of the ones that I mentioned, like uh, Mitchell or Casa Bruno or something, who uh, have a little more oomph in the marketplace. Um, I kind of don't financially. I, I I don't know where you're at with that. It's a 
there's, there's people out there with smaller amounts of wine that seem to do well, and there's people. So I, I think until you find a distribution system, you know, you start making sales and then selling out. I think that's what you need to find that right distributor. And you need to work alongside your distributor and do all that work as well. Yeah. 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 That's it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.